Doom 3 is one of those games that just seems to divide opinions, like Quake 2 and Quake 4 it seems people either love it or hate it. Developed by id Software and originally released in 2004, it was at the time a pretty gutsy reboot with a brand new id Tech 4 engine and much more of a focus on the horror elements. Updating the weapons in the enemy lineup that made Doom famous, but slowing down the combat and making it more tense and visceral. Instead of running around these large open environments taking on a dozen demons at once, you're running around much more smaller confined spaces taking on half a dozen at once. Along with Half-Life 2 it helped propel first person shooters forward and breathe life back into the genre. People often mistakenly refer to Doom 3 as survival horror, but that's not really what it is, it's more action horror. Lots of shooting things broken up by lots of little scripted sequences, but the game tries its best to scare the crap out of you, often succeeding. I've really come to love this game over the years, and though it moves to the beat of a different drum, I still do enjoy playing it as much as I do Ultimate Doom and even Doom 2016. Picking a favourite's like asking someone to pick their favourite child, or whether or not they prefer wearing socks on their left or right foot. Like a lot of PC games at the time, a console port was also in the works, but this was at a time before the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, where that gap between the PC and the consoles was still pretty large. This time around the console in question was the Xbox and the port was carried out by a development team named Vicarious Visions and released in 2005. However, this time around the port was actually pretty damn good. I think I do understand. Vicarious Visions have a pretty long history of porting games to other platforms with titles like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater to the GameCube and Star Wars Jedi Outcast to the Xbox and the GameCube. So it's no wonder that these were the guys given the mighty task of getting a game like Doom 3 working on the Xbox. Something that sounds impossible on paper. But somehow they did it and they not only managed to pull it off, but they pulled it off really well. They even managed to squeeze in playable versions of the original games too, in case for some reason you're playing Doom 3 before you've played the previous games. I've got to say at this point that this isn't a review for Doom 3 itself. I've done that already, so if you want to know what I think about the game, well, go watch that. This is more just focusing on the Xbox version, something people have suggested I take a look at for a while now. And off the back of that, you can expect a few spoilers here and there, so don't say I didn't warn you. I'm serious. Don't say I didn't warn you, bitch. Amazing things will happen here soon. You just wait. Also, I've got to give a quick shout out to Raycon who are sponsoring this video. Now, in case you don't know who these guys are, it's a company created by a dude called Ray J and they make super easy to use Bluetooth earbuds which come in this really cool little charging carry case. Seeing as I spend up to 5 or 6 hours on my computer some days editing and capturing footage, I really need something that feels comfy in my ears and I find that these are pretty spot on when it comes to that. I've got half a dozen external hard drives plugged in and USB hubs coming out of my ass, so one less cord to worry about is always welcome. They're cheaper than other earbuds on the market, about half the price. The sound quality is great and they've got up to 6 hours battery time too, which is pretty dope. The latest model is the E25 and there's a link in the description, buyraycon.com backslash gman, where you can go to get 15% off your first order. And thanks again to Raycon for supplying me with a pair for this review, it's much appreciated. Now let's get back to the video. Now, I don't have all that much experience with console ports. Alright, that's a lie, I kind of do. Especially when it comes to shooters. But at least from my own personal experience, I think this is really one of the best console ports I've ever played. If Doom 3 on the PC is Arnold Schwarzenegger, well, then this Xbox port is Franco Columbu, Arnie's mate. Standing next to Arnie, he's not all that impressive, but catch him by himself and he's still a feast for the eyes, metaphorically speaking. Metaphorically speaking... I mean, this version is still better than the BFG edition, that's for sure, because despite the changes it makes, which are more or less because of the limitations of the console, there's no weapon-mounted flashlights or increased ammo and health pickups. This is still good old-fashioned Doom 3, crushing, relentless, and dark. Man, is it dark. It really is staggering that they've been able to pull this whole thing off from a technical standpoint just to begin with. Obviously, it's not running at a super high resolution. I think the native resolution for the Xbox was 480p. It's kind of like you're playing the game but wearing Coke bottle lenses. 
Now, I played this on my Xbox 360 emulated, which automatically upscales it to 1080p, which kind of makes it look alright from a distance, but when you start to look closer, it really does look like smeared ass. This isn't the fault of the Xbox though, but I guess it's just what had to be done to get it working in the first place. Here's a few example clips side by side to give you an idea of the difference. But I think that despite there being noticeable downgrades with things like the textures, the lighting effects and the modelling for characters and weapons, they've still kept the atmosphere of the whole thing pretty damn solid. It still retains its horror atmosphere and that very stylistic aesthetic which is one I think still looks really cool. Dynamic lighting still plays a pretty big part in the overall experience and seeing the shadow of a demon across the wall before he's even moved into your field of view or watching the way that light reacts with an imp as he charges up a fireball still looks impressive. Those sections where you're guided by one of those little robot droids and it's shining its flashlight ahead or that one bit where that poor UAC scientist is trying to lead you through a pitch black area with a lantern. I mean, it still looks appealing. This whole dynamic lighting thing really is a bit of a dying craft. I mean, we just don't see it all that much anymore in gaming. At least, it's not really a focus of the overall presentation. Back then, though, it seemed like every game tried to push this into their engine at one point. You had things like Splinter Cell, Thief, Deadly Shadows, and even Far Cry at certain points. What I think also mitigates the Xbox port is that the loading times are pretty fast. I mean, they're not instant, but reloading a new level or an old save file is brisk enough that it's not a nuisance. The game can even manage to hold a steady frame rate, which is awesome. I mean, there's other games running on lesser engines that perform way worse. It really is black magic. The only problem is that if you're at all familiar with Doom 3 and you've played it enough times, well, you're gonna notice how some of the campaign has been stripped back. And even if you didn't notice it, well, your brain did. For starters, that whole intro where you land on Mars and then walk through the body scan is now entirely pre-rendered. Okay, let me get this started. The cafeteria area is missing too, and it seems like there's less NPCs moving around as well. The whole bit towards the end of Mars City, where you first run across the surface of Mars for a short period of time, has been removed entirely, and this is probably the only one that I have an issue with. Only because this was supposed to introduce you to the mechanic of how your air supply works in a low-risk environment, and it emphasized how you were limited in where you could and couldn't go throughout the base. But I guess it got the chop in lieu of faster loading times and better performance. Alpha Labs, instead of being broken down into four sectors, is now simply referred to as Alpha Labs East and West. And as a result, Alpha Labs Sector 4 is now completely missing. That was the level in the original game where you got to choose from taking two different paths forward. One that was faster but more dangerous, and another one that was longer but supposedly more safer. They still kept the end part of this though, where you've got the boss fight against the Vagary, which is still terrifying and the stuff of nightmares. But as a result, the Alpha Labs on the whole is considerably shorter. Same thing when you finally reach the Delta Labs, like this whole area has been really cut down, making it much more linear. There was a whole side bit here where you could go through a bunch of offices and holding cells, reading up on a bit of the backstory before you'd arrived on Mars. But again, it got the chop. Here's another one too, when you first get to the monorail sky bridge, instead of the whole thing collapsing and throwing you onto the surface of Mars, you instead just go straight across the bridge and into the recycling sector. But I think the area that definitely got it the worst is the central processing and data banks, the last few levels in the game when you get back from hell. Like that really cool bit when you get that jump scare from a trite crawling across the monitor is completely gone. There is a cool scripted sequence of Campbell killing an archfile with a BFG, which I don't even think was in the original. And in the game's defense, in some rare instances, they have tried to give back. I mean, it's not all just take, take, take. In Delta Lab Sector 4, before you go up against those two barons of hell, there's a creepy little scripted sequence where you see these images of the chainsaw zombie before he finally appears. Another bit in Delta Lab Sector 3, there's a quick scripted sequence where you see some poor UAC employee gunned down by a Z-Sec, which 
I don't think was even in the base game either. During the beginning of the hell level, when you get trapped in that cage and then plummet down onto the surface, they've added in all of these spiraling souls which move around the player. And if I'm being honest, it's creepy as fuck. They also added your mum into the hell level as an NPC, banished there for eternity for sucking so much dick. Now I could spend an entire video going over all of these little changes until I bleed from my asshole, but I don't think there's really any of them that change the game in a super negative way. So I don't think they're really worth complaining about. But I will say that perhaps more importantly, these level design changes do make the game a lot shorter. But it's already a bit of a bloated campaign anyway, so tightening the whole thing up ain't all that much of a bad thing. I think I do understand. One of the biggest problems is trying to play a first person shooter that's designed for the PC on a console. I mean, a keyboard has a hundred or so buttons. A controller has what, like 10? By and large though, most shooters have fared pretty well with the controller thanks to how seamless aiming and movement usually is with the left and the right sticks. Seeing as this was back when shooters didn't have weapon limits though, you've got to contend with swapping through 10 or so weapons at a time. And the lack of a keyboard and its number keys is definitely a bit of a hindrance. One workaround for this that they've tried to add in is that you can bind weapons to the buttons on the D-pad. So instead of having to swap through every single weapon until you find the shotgun, you can bind it to, you know, right on the D-pad. It's actually pretty handy and I reckon that everyone's going to have their own personal preference for what weapons they're going to want to bind here. Now it's not a perfect fix and a weapon wheel would have been amazing, but as the only possible solution it makes the most sense. Otherwise it controls pretty well and they've mapped buttons to the controller in a way that it feels seamless. Like any good console shooter should have, Doom 3 has a really handy lock-on system. Nothing groundbreaking, just aim at an enemy, start firing and the lock-on does the rest. You still do have to be aware of your surroundings and strafe left and right to do your best to avoid taking damage and if you sprint it breaks the lock-on. But it is a really smooth way of integrating the PC controls across to a controller and it handles superbly. You'll be dodging those imp fireballs in no time. Now let's hold up and not suck the game's dick too much because there are some oddities that I noticed too. For starters, I really think the shotgun's been nerfed in a way because there's times when shooting it at point blank range when it doesn't kill an enemy in a single hit when it really should be able to. Then again, Doom 3's shotgun's always been a bit of an RNG machine with the way that the pellet spread has worked, so who knows. But I do think there's some weird stuff going on with this weapon in this port. Ammunition is also a lot harder to come by as well, which I think might be just because they've removed so many of the side areas throughout all of these levels. This does become a bit of a problem sometimes, and I found I had very little plasma rifle ammo and rockets even towards the end of the campaign. It's an issue because both of these weapons are really suited for dealing with both the Revenants and the Chain Gun Commandos. The plasma rifle is great against the Revenants because it's the only weapon that can destroy their homing rockets. And the rocket launcher is great against the chain gun commandos who usually like to just hang back and shoot you from a distance like utter pricks. Lacking the right ammo type to deal with two of the tougher enemies in the game in the most effective way can make some of the late game sections really tricky. One thing I find really interesting is the way that this port handles save files. Now the way it works is that you can manually save whenever you want. You just go into the menu and create a save file which takes maybe 5 or 10 seconds and then that's it. But there's no checkpoints or anything. If you ever die, you have to reload from your last save file, or the beginning of the current level. Now this might not sound like much, but it's just such a weird thing to not include in the game. Return to Castle Wolfenstein came out on the Xbox in 2002, and that had multiple checkpoints per level. They've managed to cram all this stuff into the Xbox port. They've squeezed blood from a stone, so to speak, and get the it Tech 4 engine running on a console. But somehow, they just couldn't squeeze in checkpoints. I mean, when did the basic convenience of a checkpoint mechanic become such a tricky inclusion? One of the best features this Xbox version had though was that you could play it in co-op mode, but sadly there's no split screen option for this. You can only do it over Xbox Live or through the system link settings, which requires two copies of the game along with two TVs. And look, I really did want to give this whole thing a go. But you see, the problem with being an adult is that to get one of your similarly aged adult mates to come around with a single notion of playing a Doom 3 co-op campaign just isn't really that realistic. Oh really? Off the back of that though, there's actually a really good co-op mod for Doom 3 on the PC, simply called Open Co-op. And if you can get a server and a couple of mates together to play it, well, it's pretty damn fun. And you also get to play through the entire campaign, not just a shortened section like on the Xbox. Oh really? 
aside from all of this shit, we also got the same treatment for the expansion pack, Resurrection of Evil. And it functions pretty much the same, with a few differences here and there, but mostly it's a pretty good adaptation of the PC version to a console. One of the main things I noticed now was that instead of the flashlight, you've got a light mounted on the end of the pistol, which means you're now not entirely defenseless. Juggling through weapons though can be a bit more finicky with the expansion pack because you're now having to worry about the grabber and the artifact as well. The grabber is that gravity gun looking weapon that can be used to interact with physics objects and enemy projectiles. And the artifact is that beating heart thingy that gives you superpowers. Because you're going to be using both of these a fair bit, you'll want to map them to buttons on the D-pad for quick access, which in turn means that you'll have to overlook mapping other guns to the D-pad in lieu of this. It's not a huge issue, but it can make swapping between weapons more of a pain in the sphincter. I don't know if it really matters though, considering in this expansion pack you've got the goddamn super shotgun. And this thing is just so fucking awesome, you'll probably spend 99% of the time using this thing anyway. For all of the stuff they got wrong with this expansion pack and all of the stuff that I dislike, all is forgiven whenever I'm using this thing. What's also really helpful too is that now the boss fights have health bars, so you can tell if you're actually doing damage. Considering these bosses have gimmicks that you need to recognize before you can actually damage them, this is a pretty handy inclusion so you don't end up wasting ammo needlessly. Because let me tell you, if there's one thing I hate, it's wasting ammo needlessly. That and cockatoos, I mean those things are so fucking annoying. About the only thing I'd complain about is the performance, which seems to be a bit stuttery compared to Doom 3. Though this might have been a result of me emulating it through my Xbox 360. Also when you use the artifact, the game looks like ass, because they've used some kind of weird pixelation filter when time slows down to a crawl. Kinda looks like they've just cut the resolution in half. Otherwise, this plays out the same as Doom 3. Fast loading times, generally decent controls, and fun and enjoyable gameplay. I have to say, all things considered, if this was the first and only way you could play Doom 3 in the expansion, well, it could have been a whole lot worse. You could have played the BFG edition first and bought into that whole mounted flashlight propaganda. Now look, let's just clear this up right now. If you prefer the mounted flashlight to the actual traditional handheld flashlight, well, you're dead to me. Gotta say, there's a lot of people dead to me at the moment, as you'd probably expect. Doom 3 on the Xbox isn't a perfect copy of the PC version, but like I said before, what it removes, it removes because of limitations, instead of some kind of forced design choice. The cornerstone to the game itself is still present, and that's what matters most. Combine that with a mostly steady frame rate, and it's about all that you can really ask for. About the only thing the game doesn't do is give me a hand job under the table while I'm playing it. So as far as console ports go, Doom 3 for the Xbox, it's alright in my books. I just can't find enough of a reason to dislike it and I'm so happy and proud they managed to get it working in the first place. Now if they can get Doom Eternal running on the Xbox, that's when I'll really be impressed.